The idea to travel the country arose early in my senior year of high school. A teacher suggested I read On the Road by Jack Kerouac. I became so engrossed in the book that I was already planning my trip less than halfway through reading it. Originally, the idea was to take the trip once I'd finished college, but after some sage advice from my dad, I decided to move it up. Do it now. Life has a bad habit of getting in the way as you age. With my folks' support, I took a gap year and headed out the day after graduation. My parents believed I was traveling on a Greyhound. I had other plans, however. I rode the bus only as far as my first stop and got off. From there, I'd see the U.S. the same way my folks had. I was going to hitchhike. Along the way, I had a few strange encounters and more than one near-death experience. What follows is perhaps the worst of them all. On this day, I was traveling through southern Missouri. As night approached, the elderly gentleman that had picked me up some five miles prior said he was going to have to let me off. I believed he lived nearby and didn't want me to know where. I was just happy for the ride. I bid him goodbye and he drove away into the setting sun. Probably half an hour passed as I walked along the road shoulder, my cheap headlamp lighting the way before me. This section of road was in the middle of nowhere, thus very little traffic passed me. The sun had long set and the temperature seemed pleasant. I felt well rested and wasn't going out of my way to catch a ride. Nonetheless, an old pickup soon passed me and pulled over about 20 yards ahead. I stopped and watched for a moment just to be sure he was stopping for me. He must have realized this. The driver hung his left arm out of the window and waved me forward. I began jogging toward the truck. I was almost at the bumper when the truck lurched forward a few yards. This is a common joke that drivers play on hitchhikers. I'm sure you've seen it on at least one movie. I tried to be a good sport and laughed it off. Once again, I began quickly approaching the truck and once again the truck lurched forward a few yards. This is the part of the game, and I continued to be light-hearted about it despite actually getting very annoyed. This is usually where the joke stopped and the driver let me in. Unfortunately, my new friend didn't follow the rules. This time, the driver let me get up to the passenger's door and looked over at me. Before I could get a word out, he slammed on the gas and screeched away. I was fed up by this point. Without thinking, I made a massive mistake by giving the guy the finger... It's a thing I'd seen a million times growing up, and I'd never seen anything other than a few cross words given in exchange for it. However, for some reason, now that I've grown older, I've come in contact with more and more people who react with outright fury to this gesture, and i just met one. I was standing still as the truck began slipping off into the dark, but as soon as I stuck up my finger, the dark was illuminated by taillights. At first, I thought he was trying to lure me in again, but I soon realized he was making a three-point turn and coming back. A sick feeling began churning in my gut. I had a collapsible baton that I carried for protection and slipped it from my bag. I thought he may be coming back to start a fight. The strange part was that as he grew closer to me, the truck got faster and the grill was aimed right at me. I'd estimated it was until he was roughly 20 yards away and closing fast that I turned and ran. For all intents and purposes, I was now running for my life. I tried to shake him by cutting into the field alongside the road, but he followed. Then I cut across to the other side. That side was enclosed by a metal tubular fence I had to quickly climb. To my amazement, he plowed the fence over like it wasn't there. I looped back around and out onto the road. He was now very close. I could feel the heat of his engine on my back. I could also feel my body beginning to wear out. One misstep or stumble and I'd be smashed. Perhaps another ten seconds later I noticed a turnoff coming up on my left. When I was close enough I cut off the pavement and down the road. Up ahead there was some bushes and a wooded area. I summoned up all the power I had left and pulled away. I reached the trees and dove into a ravine. I switched off my headlamp and crawled down under some fallen trunks. It was the first time since this all began that I felt safe, but still, it wasn't quite over. I laid as still as I could and tried to slow my breathing. 
I could hear the low rumble of the truck's engine passing just yards away. All of a sudden, the woods lit up like a summer day. Unknown to me, that crazy redneck had a spotlight mounted on his truck. The beam passed by my hiding place more than once. At one point, I was sure he had seen me, but he never did. He gradually got further and further down the road until I felt safe enough to move. Over the course of that night, I crawled deeper into the woods. His light would pass by my hiding place occasionally, but I was now too far away to be seen. Around 4 a.m., I finally heard the engine rev up and the tires screech as he sped away, this time for good. I remained in my last hiding spot until well after dawn. The chase had so worn me out that I fell asleep despite still being terrified. And just after 10 a.m., I quietly and carefully stepped from the trees. This guy wasn't anywhere I could see, but I stayed off the road for the rest of that week. Early that Sunday morning, I got a ride from a family going into Oklahoma for a rodeo. I kept my pursuit to myself, though. I didn't want to lay my problems on some complete strangers, and as we passed into Oklahoma, I let out a big sigh of relief. I'm sure they thought I was crazy, but they were too nice to say anything. That night on the road still haunts my dreams occasionally. My meeting with the family begins a new interesting chapter in my own on-the-road story, but I'll save that for another time. Let's just say I spent a night in the hospital after a run-in with a nasty bull. Until we meet again, friends, stay free and never grow old. After my discharge from the military, I had a lot of trouble adjusting. My wife could tell I was struggling especially hard one morning and suggested I go for a walk in the nearby woods. To her credit, it turned out to be the best thing for me. I had forgotten how peaceful nature could be. I walked aimlessly for a while until I came upon a log and sat down. I'm not sure how long I sat there just taking in all of God's creation. I do know that I didn't want to go back. The only thing awaiting me was screaming children and the overwhelming crush of responsibility. And that's when I came up with an idea. Reluctantly, I returned to the house and pulled my wife into the bathroom so we could talk. We each took a seat and I explained my plan to her. She agreed without hesitation. And that was the second I knew she was too good for me. With her blessing, I gathered my kit together and hoofed it all the way back into the woods... For the next three days, I camped and explored almost every inch of those woods. I lived off the land, taking only when I needed, and when I emerged, it was like being reborn. From that point on, nature would be my retreat. Another year passed and I continued my little escapes, as my wife called them. I initially stuck close to home, but I soon began to crave a new environment. This brings us to the focus of my story. Not far from me was a large tract of forest used by motorcycle and ATV riders. I'd been curious to check it out, but wanted to wait until traffic decreased with the arrival of colder weather. When the time arrived, I packed up all my kit onto my old Honda Quad and began my journey. I stuck to major trails at first. As I became somewhat comfortable with my surroundings, I cut off onto an older, long, unused one. It was about 4 p.m. when I came across this open area near a creek. I made camp and watched the sunset from a chair I'd made with my own two hands. The next morning, I was getting water when I noticed an old shack setting off under some trees just on the other side of the creek. I planned to check it out after a quick breakfast. Things got away from me and it was almost lunch before I got around to it. I didn't expect there was much to see, but... Noticed the windows had been covered with burlap, a sure sign of use. I decided to approach from the back. I picked up the tracks of a large automobile, like an SUV. They were very fresh, probably no more than a day. Upon the front door, I saw that two padlocks had been placed there. No more than 30 seconds passed before the sound of a truck echoed down the road. I didn't realize I was running until I had reached the tree line. I was hiding and didn't know why either. I watched as a white Silverado parked in front of the shack. 
the passengers stayed inside for almost a minute. Then, almost in unison, two men stepped out from the Chevy. Both were armed with carbines and wearing armor. The two men stood guard while a third man stepped from the front passenger seat and unlocked the door. The driver soon joined him after, followed by the two lookouts. This had to have been cartel business, and now I was trapped, stuck between a path to safety and a group of potential heartless killers. I'd always assumed they'd work this side of the border, but now I had proof. An hour passed and still no closer to escape. The two guards were doubtlessly watching from the windows, just waiting for one little move. The sig on my hip would do little against two men with rifles. If I was found, my family would never know what became of me. There was no way that I could do that to them. I had no other choice but to sit tight and wait. Fortunately, my respite soon came. The group of men exited the building, one carrying two duffel bags. The guards took one last look around and the Chevy disappeared back down the same road it had arrived on. No sooner did the truck disappear from sight that I bolted from cover back across the creek. I gathered my things and gunned my quad back to civilization. The long ride allowed me time to decide my next course of action. I could act as if nothing had happened or go to the cops. By the time I arrived home, I'd made my choice. I drove my truck directly to the sheriff and told them what I'd seen. I had no proof of any illegal activity per se, but... They told me that they'd check it out. My good deed had been done. It was up to the cops now. But now another nine months went by and no news had reached me. My curiosity got the best of me and I took the Honda back out to take a look-see. I took a position not far from my old camp and set up. And I'd be shocked by what I saw. The old shack was no longer standing. Not gone completely, but from what I could tell... It had been burned down. I decided to take a closer look. On scene, things were much clearer. Not much remained other than some assorted small pieces of metal and charred furniture. I was happy to see it gone, but a little flame of curiosity still burns inside me regarding exactly how it got that way. What had become of the men I'd seen and what had they been doing? I suppose I'll never know. I often remember that little shack in the middle of nowhere and wonder how many forgotten places like it exist in this country and what awful things may be going on inside of them. If I come across any others, I'll be sure to share them here. I'll see you all out on the trail. The image of that day is permanently burned into my mind. It was September 3rd, 2002. Our country was still grieving from the attacks the year prior and patriotism was at a two-decade high. i just met my wife at a friend's birthday party a month earlier. Everything was looking rosy for me. Work was my only weak point, and when I say weak, I simply mean I was stuck in a rut. Not good, nor bad. A day or two before Halloween, I saw my chance to further myself in the company. There was an amazing opportunity opening up in Mexico City, but if I wanted to take advantage, I had to fly out as soon as possible. After discussing this with my boss, he gave me the okay to pursue it. I immediately purchased a plane ticket for midnight and landed just as the sun rose the next morning. And according to my contacts, the man I was planning to meet wouldn't be available until after 8am. I took advantage of the gap in time by taking a nap. When I woke up, I took a quick shower and climbed into my best suit. I was about to make the most important contact in my life and looking my best would be of the utmost necessity. As the time approached, I called down to the front desk to get me a taxi. I reached the lobby where a young man showed me to my ride. I was feeling good that morning and in retrospect, I made a big mistake. Foolishly, I tipped the clerk a $50 bill. His eyes almost blew out of his head. In light of what happened, I'm almost positive he was the person who sold me out. From the hotel, the taxi driver took me to my meeting. We made small talk along the way. He agreed to wait for me. 
I estimated the meeting wouldn't be more than an hour and he seemed happy for this. As for the meeting itself, it probably could have gone better, but my goal was ultimately achieved. I returned to the taxi and we began the return trip to the hotel. My mood was somewhat darker and I avoided any conversation. I was in the process of texting my boss when the car stopped abruptly. This caused me to be slammed into the back of the seat. Naturally, I was livid. The curses came fast and loose from my mouth. Just as I regained the seat positioning, I noticed another taxi was parked in front of us. The driver of my car was silent. This didn't stop me from asking what was going on. I now realized that he was well aware of what was happening and may have played his own part in it. If I hadn't been yelling like a madman, I may have noticed the guy standing outside my window a little sooner. I just happened to catch a flash in my peripheral vision. When I looked over, I was met with a gun pointed right at me. I wasn't sure what was going on, but I raised my hands to indicate I was no threat. The guy holding the gun yanked my door open and demanded I give him my money. I quickly complied. While this was happening, a voice in the back of my head was praying he wouldn't notice my watch. It was very special to me. It belonged to my father. He was gifted it by my mother on their 25th anniversary. I received it in his will when he passed in 97. Under normal circumstances, I wouldn't wear something so valuable, especially in Mexico, but it had been good luck in the past and I needed it on this trip. All this caused me to hesitate when the gunman started yelling watch in broken English. I tried to pretend I didn't understand. He grabbed at my wrist with his empty hand instead. I stupidly yanked my arm away and he drove the pistol into my guts. Everything went into slow motion. I watched in horror as the hammer on the revolver began cocking back. He clearly wasn't messing around. I managed to get the watch off before the gun went off. He let off the trigger, just in time as far as I could tell. He ran back to the other taxi and they tore off down a side street. I was just beginning to see that I had been taken into the middle of nowhere. Not a soul was around and the buildings were barely standing upright. Had I been ten years younger, I probably would have fought back. The environment in the taxi afterwards was chilling. I could see the driver's eyes darting back and forth in the rearview mirror. He didn't dare speak. He had to know I suspected him. Why hadn't he been robbed also? I now had an important decision to make. Was I going to the police or just returning to the hotel and then going to the airport? I was stuck between two decisions. It's no secret the Mexican police are corrupt. For all I know, even they could be complicit in the robbery. The angry side of me said to confront the hotel clerk. I took a few moments to consider my options and chose to cut my losses and just get out of Mexico. I told the driver to return to the hotel if he wanted to be paid. This wasn't my first rodeo after all. I never carried much cash on my person. What I left behind would be all but impossible to find if a hotel employee went snooping. Upon our return, I ran up to my room and retrieved the taxi money. I paid him without a word and he took off just as silently. It was now time for the clerk to feel my wrath, and he greeted me with a fake smile and asked how things were going. In a calm but aggressive voice, I mentioned the robbery. I had no time for his false sympathy and informed him how his accomplices had gotten away with the mere $30 in cash. There was no way I was going to give him the satisfaction of knowing how badly the loss of my father's watch hurt me. He tried to deny it all, of course, but I wasn't hearing it. Not once did he offer to call the police. I told him that I knew what he'd done, and that I was going to make sure everyone I talked to was aware of what was happening in this hotel. I closed by calling him a low-life scumbag and made my way from my room. It wasn't much, but it was going to have to do. I went back to my room and gathered my things to leave. I paid for the hotel beforehand, and my plane ticket was a round trip. I had no further need of that place and its staff. There were several taxis waiting outside the hotel. I grabbed one, and he drove me to the airport, and I had no further problems from then on. I had waited to notify my boss of the robbery until I returned to work. He was horrified, as you'd expect. I also made sure that he knew I was never returning to Mexico again. He could fire me if he wanted, but there was no amount of money that could draw me back there. 
To his credit, he was cool and understood my reservations. My next call was to the man I'd gone there to meet. I wasn't contacting him for any updates as much as letting him know that I'd be passing off any future dealings to another team member. When he inquired why, I told him about the robbery and stress that I held him in no way responsible for it. He didn't say much other than he understood and we ended the call. I must admit I was somewhat shocked when I heard that he had agreed to the deal. Even better, he would be coming to the US in the future as to prevent any further threats to our employees. I can't say for sure, but I kind of think he may have felt guilty, although I made it clear I didn't blame him. We've never talked about it, and that's fine with me. I'd rather forget about it myself. This will be my last time discussing the matter. There was one last call I had to make, and it was the hardest. The sadness in her voice upon hearing of the watch was crystal clear. Mom said she didn't blame me, but I could tell it hurt her soul to hear that. It was the first time I can remember crying since second grade. I've since purchased another day date made the same year and had it inscribed with the same words as Dad's. I wear it every year at Christmas, and that's all. Mom loves seeing it, but I'm well aware it will never be a true replacement for the original. Deep in the middle of nowhere America in the early hours of March 3rd, 1980, a girl is born. She was the apple of her parents' eyes. From that day on, she could do no wrong. Every birthday was a celebration of her greatness. As she grew into womanhood, she stumbled not once. Her beliefs were always in line with modern thinking and her opinions were never the wrong ones. If you were to ask them, her folks would put her on par with the angels as near as to divine and beautiful as humanly possible. This is all BS, of course. The girl was never honest with her elders, not fair to her peers. In school, her grades were average at best. Her awkward fumblings with boys were well known. No one around her age respected or liked her. There were a few she controlled through fear, but in time, even they would break away. The child was nothing like the divine creature her parents viewed her to be. You ask, how do you know all this? Well, you see, I was foolish enough to marry her. I'll refer to her as Alicia from here on. Alicia and I had known one another since middle school. We'd grown up not far apart. Her beauty was a truly breathtaking thing to behold, but it was her only redeeming value. For some strange reason, I was the guy she chose. Over time, I'd come to discover why. Her upbringing had made her an abusive narcissist. This was a major turnoff for most guys on her level. I guess guys on my level were more susceptible to her feminine powers. She knew she had me on the hook from the beginning, but not once did she abuse me the way she did everyone else. I'm not sure I would have broken it off if she had. The relationship had its ups and downs like most do. Every few months we get into an argument and break up, only be back together soon after. Anytime society robbed her of something, which was often, I was the one there to prop her up. Maybe at the time I actually believed the world was out to get her. She certainly did. Through every bit of drama, I never considered life without her in it. That's certainly why I followed her to community college, despite being accepted to Stanford. I honestly thought that we'd be moving there after two years anyway. Per usual, she barely survived those two years. The grades were terrible, and she had to appeal after flunking out of her first semester. I would do all her homework after that and drill her relentlessly until she passed. She was never really stupid. She'd just been raised to believe everything was hers by right. At the end of that time period, she took a terrible job for her friend's interior design company. When I brought up moving to California, she claimed her job was too important to give up. After a lot of inner conflict, I gave up my dream of Stanford and found a nearby university to attend. Four years would fly by. I continued on with school while she bounced from one dead-end job to the other. Our first daughter was born along this time. Alicia took a long time to bounce back mentally, but when our second daughter arrived three years later, she seemed fine. By then, I was teaching at the high school. A last-minute death in the staff meant I was 
filling in as a wrestling coach too. This meant I was spending less time at home. Alicia had long since quit working to raise the girls, a situation I had no problem with. Unfortunately, this gave her time to brood. She began accusing me of having an affair. The saddest aspect of all this was the fact that I still loved her just as much as the day we met. I never once thought of other women. The accusations broke my heart. The claims of cheating had been going on for almost six months. Strangely, one day they all stopped. Two days passed until I had a free day to spend with her and the girls. Everything was great all throughout the day. She even cooked me a wonderful dinner. Afterwards, I was so exhausted I let her know that I was turning in early. I expected this would make her mad, but she looked angry. I should have known things weren't right when she tucked me in. She'd never been the type to do that, not even for the kids. It didn't set off any alarms at the time, though, and soon I was sound asleep. At some point, I was awakened by a sharp pain in my chest. I fought to wake up. I also noticed a pounding sensation. I finally got my eyes open and I saw a form on my chest banging on it repeatedly. I was in that state where I wasn't sure if I was dreaming. Waking up was strangely difficult, but I eventually managed to do it. With my eyes wide open now, I could tell that form was Alicia. I couldn't understand what she was doing, but I knew it hurt. I summed up all the power I could and pushed her off. I ran my hand across my chest and felt a wetness. It took a second to realize that she had been stabbing me. That was when I began to panic. She was already attempting to mount me again, but I fought her off. I knew I had to get away. My legs felt like I was running through the mud, and I didn't know why. I didn't make it to the door before she jumped on my back and renewed her attack. My survival instincts had kicked in now, and I slung her to the floor, but she sprung back at me. I impulsively struck her twice across the chin, which knocked her out cold. I'm still amazed at what I did. It was something I know I couldn't have done in any other circumstance. This gave me a chance to get a phone and call for help. Our oldest had been awakened by all the noise. She noticed the blood all over me and began to cry. I covered it up by saying I'd spilled ketchup on myself, and I'm not sure she bought it, but she did go back to bed when I asked her to. By now, I could hear Alicia trying to escape from the bedroom. I was in no condition to stop her. I now know she had drugged me. I ran into the hall bathroom and locked myself in. Only now did the blood loss begin to affect me. The dispatcher did her best to keep me awake, bless her heart, but within a few minutes, everything went black. When I regained consciousness the following day, the pain was agonizing. My yelling alerted a nurse who came in and adjusted my IV. Not much happened for a few days. I remember short spurts of consciousness, but not much more. On the fourth day, I awoke on my own, still uncomfortable but feeling better. A nurse arrived and let me know which buttons did what. She left and returned a little while later with breakfast. It was the first time in my life I'd ever had grits. I was so hungry I devoured everything. After lunch is when the cops showed up. I certainly wasn't expecting what I'd heard. It turned out that Alicia tried to rush the responding officers with a knife and they shot her. She had survived and was recuperating just down the hall. And on a positive note, my girls were staying with my mom. I thank her to this day for having the presence of mind not to bring them to me. This all happened in 2008 and I wasn't able to fully explain the entire mess to them for a few years. For the sake of brevity, I was released later that week and Alicia was transferred to the county jail a few days later. She soon took a plea and agreed to 15 years. With all that resolved, I tried to focus on my daughters. I've been fortunate enough to have two supportive parents who've helped me out a lot. Sacrificing my teaching job was something of a disappointment, but administration gave me a regular 9 to 5 arrangement. My oldest is nearing graduation and her sister isn't far behind. I'm amazed at how well they've handled everything, especially growing up into womanhood without a mother. Alicia reached out to them once or twice, but they refused the invitation. I'm never bad to talk to her around them, even after what she did. The choice had always been left up to them. At the end of the day, I think Alicia is the one who suffered the most from all of this. Listen, I'm not making her a victim. 
She was 100% responsible for her actions, but I know for a fact being away from her daughters was torture. The wounds she received never fully healed. The few times I did speak to her, she made mention of her constant pain. Then, just as she was nearing the end of her sentence, she contracted COVID and passed away. It definitely wasn't an ending anyone deserves. Not even her. The older I become, I'm less and less capable of ignoring my prior bad actions. I recently turned 36. It's no longer possible for me to hide what I took part in or act as if I don't feel an indescribable level of guilt. I'm writing this anonymously to confess my crime in some ways. My fear of prison equals only to the loss of my family. Being separated from them would be a fate worse than death. Had I not become sober, the truth would have probably died with me. And this is going to have to do. Once the story is posted, the account will be abandoned and left to the whims of Reddit. Contacting me will just be a waste of time, and it's better if you simply read this and go about your day. This confession is made for my own sake alone. Nobody needs to act on this information, and you'll garner no benefit in doing so. My troubles likely stem from my childhood. My parents, unlike many of my friends, remain married to this day. Punishment was never unwarranted or excessive, but it was the only real time I was given attention by my father. He merely existed as a financial resource. Even now, we have no real emotional connection. I include this information only to illustrate the feelings of emptiness I've carried for most of my life. On the other hand, I could have been born emotionally stunted from the beginning. I suppose the reasons matter little when you get down to it. To most, they will be nothing more than cowardly excuses. And either way, what I'm about to say is disgusting and should be viewed as such. I know what I did was wrong. The real problems began when I left home for college. Not being particularly smart put me at a considerable disadvantage. My grades were already low before I made friends of the locals, but it didn't take long for me to begin my long slide down. For the sake of anonymity, I'll call these two guys Mike and Kevin. We met at a local dive bar that served us underage. My parents didn't drink, and I've only ever drunk once in my life before college. This gave me a very warped relationship with alcohol. From the start, I drank until I barfed, every time. That's probably why those two liked me so much. I had no off button once I got started, just like them. Soon enough, I was doing drugs with them. I don't mean a little pot, either. I dove right into the deep end and barely treaded water for the next 14 years. You can guess what happened. By sophomore year, I was kicked out. I didn't bother to tell my parents. They just kind of guessed after I stopped coming home for holidays. Honestly, I'm actually glad it happened. I'm not left with the crippling debt most of my peers have. But anyhow, I began doing small jobs and selling drugs to get by. Things like coke and X mainly. Partying became the sole focus of my life. My personal drinking and drug use was growing out of control, and this resulted in the story I'm about to share. I'd like to think I wouldn't have done anything like it otherwise. It took place on one of my booze and dope-filled binges. I was with Kevin. I'm not sure where Mike was. I don't guess it matters anyhow. I do recall that we've been getting high since around lunchtime. It was already way after dark when we got to the bar. Just by chance, we ran into another guy from the neighborhood. He was a few years younger and had that little brother annoying hanger-on vibe about him. As the night drew on, this kid got drunker and drunker. He became very verbally aggressive with us. I'm not sure if he thought he was being funny or felt tough. It didn't matter. After an hour of this, we'd had enough. When he stumbled off to the can, we started making plans. Not to kill him, but give him a butt kicking he'd never forget. He returned and we invited him along to get some coke. He was down with it, but we had other plans though. We all piled into my car and drove out to a quiet place we'd been to before. We didn't see it coming from what I could tell. Even as we stood before him preparing to beat him up, he was still asking about the blow. I believe I was the first to hit him. After that, no one was keeping score. In retrospect, a sober me would have stopped far sooner, 
but neither of us were anything close to it. The beating went on for about five minutes. To our credit, I don't think we kicked him in the head. Like I said, it was just to teach him a lesson. When we were done, we flipped him over, and he was still breathing. I remember that specifically. I also recall the rattle sound in his throat as he did. In our drug-addled minds, we thought it was so funny to leave him out in the middle of nowhere. So we leaned his battered body against a tree and left him there. Not once did I think he was dead or close to it. I'd been beaten far worse in the past and partied the next day. Speaking of the next day, the horror of what we'd done hit me hard. I tried to justify it in my mind. When I could no longer do so, I got high to forget. This went on until I was able to ignore it. We weren't sure if the beating would be enough to stop the kid from coming around. We hoped it would, but if it didn't, we hoped he'd at least keep his tongue in check from then on. Drugs were the only reason we'd hung out with him in the first place. When he disappeared, I don't remember anyone missing him or even mentioning him after that. This incident was a mere blip in my downward spiral of alcohol and drug addiction. I was able to put it behind me in a terrifyingly quick amount of time. Several more instances would occur, but none reached the level of depravity that this subject did. Years would pass in a blur. My so-called friends would sell me out the first chance they got. Even then, that night was never mentioned. Although I may sound bitter about what they did, jail would prove to be a godsend. Unable to get high for the first time in years, I was forced to face my problems. All but one. For a long time, I wasn't sure if it even occurred. I know now this was just my brain's way of coping. Now that I've been clean for over four years, the truth of that night is becoming more transparent by the days. There hasn't been a night in the last year that I haven't relived it in my dreams. Perhaps nightmares would be a better word. Last night was the final straw. Awaking soaked in sweat and screaming as my wife called me was the end of the road. If I didn't at least tell someone what happened, I would soon go mad. And telling my wife is impossible. I would rather die. She knows some of my past, but I'm sure hearing this would destroy her love for me. That is a sacrifice I would make to no one. You may have noticed I had never stated whether the victim in question died from that beating. The truth is, I don't know. I've been too afraid to search out any information. Being certain would probably drive me to make an irrevocable choice. A choice that would positively destroy my family. For the time being, I have to hope this confession may alleviate at least some of the crushing disgust and guilt I feel. If it does, what I do doesn't affect you in any way. Therefore, the reader's part ends here. Whether or not you think about this matter the seconds after you click away, for the good of yourself and those you love around you, think twice before you step onto the path of drugs and alcohol. My wife should serve as an example to you. I once considered myself a kind and decent person. I'm sure you can see that drug use has stripped that from me. If you don't care about yourself, remember, there are others who do. This story takes place in the late 90s. At this time, I was living in the upper Midwest, a state near the Canadian border to be more specific. Ever since I can remember, I have had a deep love of hunting. The actual act of taking an animal's life was not something I enjoyed, but the thrill of the pursuit, not to mention the tranquility of nature, was a thing unparalleled. Either it's something you understand or you don't. I can't describe it any better. While unfortunately, health problems and age have limited my ability to take to the woods as I used to, during this time I never passed up a chance. Deer was my main prey. However, on more than one occasion, I accompanied some friends out west to hunt elk and moose. These trips always required more walking than I preferred, so after the third year, I decided to bail out and focused on my beloved whitetails. The reason I mention so much about hunting is because the incident I witnessed occurred on one of my many hunting trips. At no point during that day was there any hint at what I was about to experience. I set out just before dawn and sat at the base of my favorite tree. It was surrounded by bushes on three sides, thus creating the perfect hide. 
I remained there until just after 9am, at which time I decided to do a little tracking. I did eventually come across some sign, but determined it was too old to do me any good. I continued nonetheless and ran into a small lake I'd never seen before. The area I had stumbled into had been closed to hunting until just recently. Being the first man to hunt this land in God knows how long made this trip worth it regardless of whether I bagged a buck or not. The day this occurred just happened to be unseasonably warm. Happening upon the lake seemed like a divine gift, at least at first. Midday was generally accepted as a bad time to hunt. I figured I'd do just as the deer usually did and bed down for a while. I unloaded the round from the chamber and set my rifle against a large oak and approached the lake. I pulled my handkerchief from my vest pocket and squatted down to dip it in the hoped-for cool water. Now fully soaked, I raised it to my forehead and squeezed it. The water ran down my face and I instantly felt relieved. There was another thing I noticed, though. A strange smell emitted from the liquid. I paused and just assumed it was the sweaty bandana and continued cooling myself. While I was there, I figured I'd go ahead and top off my canteen. Just as I lowered it to fill, I caught sight of something alarming. Less than a foot below the surface, the face of a dead deer stared back at me. This explained the smell. No woodsman worth his salt would drink water containing a corpse. It would be a guaranteed trip to the hospital and a long, miserable battle with his innards. I was greatly disappointed to encounter such a stomach-turning scene in such a beautiful setting. My first instinct was to wash my hands and face with soap and some fresh water from the canteen, which I quickly did. As for the hanky, I dug a small hole and buried it. Certainly not a necessary measure, but I didn't want to take any chances. Now I was curious. I decided to walk around a little and examine the lake a tad closer. What I found was of great concern and more than a bit bewildering. With each step I took, I would see part of or all of a dead animal in the water, just about every member of the animal kingdom currently inhabiting the U.S. and a few I couldn't identify, and they were rotting in that lake. More than a few beautiful large bucks lay just under the surface. One had such a large, luxurious rack it reached a good foot out of the water, and never before had I seen such a sight of carnage in my life. Briefly, I assumed they had been shot by poachers and disposed of, but at least the animals I could see clearly had no visible injuries. The longer I stayed there, the creepier my surroundings became. I could probably chalk that up to my mind getting to me, but it made no difference. I had to get away from that lake right then before I ended up taking a permanent nap alongside my fellow animal cousins. There was one thing I had to do first, though. I returned to my pack and dug through it until I came across a small glass vial I kept among my small accessories. As carefully as possible, I lowered it into the water and filled it. I closed it as tightly as possible and sealed it into an empty sandwich bag. Once again, I made sure to wash my hands well. I had a friend who was a well-respected professor at a nearby university and my plan was to get him to test it, more for my curiosity than anything else. After my trip ended, I did just that. I gave him a brief description of what I'd seen and left him the sample. He promised to get it back to me when he could. Not once did he show concern. As usual, I returned to work, and time flew by. I wasn't able to get back to my buddy for another month or two, and on a quiet Saturday morning, I rang him up. I could tell he sounded a bit nervous. Initially, he tried to tell me that the sample was normal. It didn't seem right, but... He was the pro, not me. I continued to describe how strange the scene had been. Small talk, mainly, and soon he was trying to convince me to forget about it. The urgency in his voice bothered me greatly, but I did let it go. Perhaps there was something he wasn't prepared to say over the phone and some secret science-y stuff, I don't know. I wasn't sure. The call soon ended, and I put that question on the back burner for the time being. Months had passed by and I began to focus on more family-related things. Christmas was quickly approaching and the family and me had lots of shopping to do. On one of these occasions, I caught sight of my old friend. I hadn't intended to grill him about anything in particular that morning. The two of us were less than 20 yards apart and I called out to him. 
He visibly turned and made eye contact before turning just as quickly and hurrying away. I must admit I was a bit taken aback in the moment. We'd known one another for over 30 years and he'd never avoided talking to me before. In fact, he was usually the fella to instigate a discussion. Despite being somewhat hurt about it, there wasn't much I could do. Another old friend had passed from my life. All well, so was the plight of man. That year quickly ran its course, along with another. Three years passed until I was able to get back to that part of the woods. This morning would go much differently. As I broke through the trees, I believed myself to be lost. Surely I had to be lost. The surroundings had greatly changed in the years since. The massive pond or lake, whichever you chose to call it, was gone. There was small signs of the area past, but had you not known it, you wouldn't have picked them up. I did double-check my map to be certain of my location. My time in the army had transformed me from a middling to darn good navigator. The map I held in my hand even showed the once existing lake, there was no doubt. That stinky, horrid pool of death had disappeared. I can't say I was sad to see it go. Nonetheless, its disappearance was just as strange as its existence, perhaps even more so. From then on, I would follow a destructive path, one that only served to alienate and harm those close to me. In the many years since that whole nonsensical event took place, I still struggle with what I had encountered that morning. While a body of water being a source of death to those creatures around it is not unheard of, the events that unfolded in the months and years following are really confusing and agonizing to me. My friend and I may not have been as close as we once were, and perhaps forces in his life beyond his control drove us apart. But when a large body of water disappears into thin air with no reasonable explanation, that's a jump in reality I'm just not prepared to take. I'm not an excavator or engineer. Heck, I'm not even much of a gardener, but I do know one thing. It takes a lot of organization and equipment to fill in a natural lake in the middle of nowhere. It takes even more talent to make it look like it never happened. Somebody, somewhere, wanted that cursed body of water to be gone and forgotten. Their identity will more than likely never be known to anyone outside their group. Nor do I think of this little puzzle of mine matters much in the overall scheme of things. Nonetheless... I couldn't allow it to slip away unnoted into the depths of history. Now that I'm a sick old man with no one left to tell my story, I'm putting pen to paper. Included with my account is the original map showing the location of the Phantom Lake. To whatever poor soul discovers this envelope, I beg you don't repeat the same mistakes I made. You may be the new keeper of this information, but it doesn't mean you must share it. I advise you to keep your mouth shut and play nice. I regret that I didn't. You may be left in peace if you do. Ultimately, what you choose to do with this story is solely up to you. Regardless of your choice, I wish you luck and may God protect you in the lives of all you hold dear. What follows happened to me in the summer of 2015. To the average listener, this tale will sound ridiculous and implausible. I assure you every bit of it is based in fact, and I was the individual who experienced it. I pray you'll be able to suspend your cynicism and take my story to heart. At the center of it lies a terrible truth, and paying attention to it may prevent others from going through what I did. Those of you who remain, I thank you for your time and ask you share my story with anyone you believe may benefit from it. We start after college graduation in 2014. I found employment as a legal assistant in a southwestern state. All had gone smoothly for the first year and there was no indication I was in any danger going forward. One quiet July evening I was leaving the office after working late. This was not uncommon when the firm was working large scale cases such as class action suits. I was on my way to my car when a van drove up alongside me. Two men wearing ski masks jumped out and held me while one put a fabric bag on my head. My hands were then zip-tied behind my back and I was hurled into the van. The entire incident couldn't have lasted more than 30 seconds. No one spoke as the van sped away, not even me. I was too terrified and didn't dare ask what was happening. 
Ignorance seemed preferable to certainty, if you get my drift. Several minutes passed until my captors began to talk among themselves. Unfortunately, they were speaking Spanish, a language I knew very little of at this point. This is when I began to try and bargain for my life. I'm almost completely resigned myself to the fact that I'd be violated, but dying wasn't something I wanted. I wasn't sure if they'd understand me, but I was sure going to try. Slowly and clearly as possible, I expressed my desire to live and reminded them that I could not identify them. Once they were done doing what they wanted, they could let me go without fear of being arrested. And just to be thorough, I added that I couldn't understand their language. This was when the van stopped moving. I heard the doors open and close. It appeared I was now alone while my captors discussed my fate outside. However, the longer I sat and listened, I could hear the breathing of another person. I began to call out to them, Hello, hello. I repeated this five times before a voice told me to shut up. This person had to have been a native English speaker. He had no accent, but then again, that could just be my American prejudices showing through. I don't know for sure. Maybe ten minutes passed and I heard the doors open again. I assumed that they were about to do their business. As the seconds ticked by, my heart pounded harder and harder. I started to consider my position. If I wanted to survive, I was going to need to stay as calm as possible, no matter how horrible things became. Then again, maybe I won't want to live when it's all over. I suppose it was possible, but at that moment in time, all I wanted to do was see my parents again. One of my captors began pulling at my blouse. Okay, it's starting. You can do this. Just pretend you're somewhere else. My breathing started to quicken. I repeated these thoughts in my mind despite the dread that I felt. The way he was undressing me was confusing. I couldn't understand why he was lifting my sleeve. When I felt the poke of the needle, I realized what he had been doing. All my self-control went out the window and I began screaming and thrashing. I was going to go out fighting. It took less than a few seconds before everything went black. Waking up was a very disconcerting experience. I must admit I was a bit disappointed with the afterlife in which I found myself. Not only did I feel like a truck had hit me, my surroundings looked exactly like the state that I'd been killed in. My hands had been unbound and the bag removed, and it soon became obvious I had not been murdered. Rather, I must have been put under and then dumped. There didn't appear to be any signs of assault either, which posed a big question. Why abduct me in the first place? Don't misconstrue my words. I was overjoyed not having been ravaged, but my captor's intentions were just confusing. What was I missing? After a brief self-assessment, finding my way home seemed wise, so... As they say, I was just some Yankee in the desert, basically the middle of nowhere. Luckily for me, I stumbled upon a road and got picked up before dark. My ride left me at the nearest police station and I recounted all I remember to the detectives. With a new lease for life, I did my darndest to carry on as if the whole mess never happened. It took me some time before the realities really hit me. I was able to fake it at first, but I found myself breaking out into sobbing fits at work for what I thought was no reason. In my mind, nothing bad had happened to me so I shouldn't have PTSD. I turned out to be wrong. Only after attending counseling for several years have I come to see just how damaging the abduction had been to me mentally. I'm determined not to let my fears beat me. So far, I'm getting by. Only time will determine if I'm able to fully heal, so perhaps you guys could pray for me. I'm sure you're all wondering what became of my kidnappers, and the truth is rather disappointing, I'm afraid. Out of the estimated four to five men present at the time, only one man had been identified, and not even he is a certainty. The police were always just a step behind him. Any hopes were dashed when his body was discovered dismembered in the desert and I've heard no other names mentioned, so I'm not optimistic. As for the reason, there seems to be a bit more to chew on. Just a few weeks after my kidnapping, a girl was abducted from her work across town. She was the daughter of a Mexican official. 
Unfortunately, she was never released. This incident led the cops to believe I was grabbed by mistake. Something as simple as a confusion over the north and south ends of a street almost cost me my life. I ask that you keep the family of that poor girl in your thoughts this year as you join together to give thanks. Never let someone tell you small mistakes can't add up to something large and life-changing. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, why did the coffee file a police report? It got mugged.